Welcome to Interactive Threat Defense, Incident Response, Threat Intel, and Red Teaming. Oh my. Our speaker is Eric Goldstrom, and uh, he's the Security Incident Response Manager at Cambia Health Solutions in Portland. He built a new program called the Interactive Threat Defense, which will be the subject of the presentation. And prior to the private sector, Eric worked in the DOD conducting both computer network exploitation and computer network defense operations. He has an MS in cybersecurity and his certifications include the CISSP, OSCP, and SANS certification. Would you please give a warm welcome to Eric. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, B-Sides PDX, for having me, and thank you all very much for attending my presentation. Today I'll be talking about interactive threat defense, like you said, which is a culmination of incident response, threat intelligence, and red teaming. And the goal of the presentation is for, to provide small and medium-sized businesses an avenue to implement these capabilities if they don't already have them today, and for large companies to kind of combine these capabilities together and make them more effective. So it's gonna start uh, kind of strategic, and then as I progress, it'll get a little bit more tactical, a little bit more tactical. And then finally, I'll be discussing some open source uh, tools that you can use along the way. So here's the agenda. Um, first, I'll start with a quick intro, and then a background about how ITD became, uh, came to be. And then I'm gonna be diving into instant response, threat intelligence, and red teaming, what they are, why they're important to any organization, and ways to get started. Now, if I created the presentation correctly, I put a higher ratio of content for specific functions. So just out of curiosity, how many of you at your organization with a show of hands have an instant response program? Almost everybody. That was almost, that's awesome. Now, how many of you have a threat intelligence function at your organization, show of hands? About half, okay. Now, how many of you have a red teaming function? A little bit less, okay. So I think I got the ratio right, but, um, how many of you just have insanely good OPSEC and don't want to say otherwise? Okay, we got, got a couple, got a couple. Fair enough, I respect that. Now towards the end of the presentation, I'll be providing examples about how um, this actually works out, and then I'll, get, I'll fill some questions. So who am I? I already had a great introduction, so I'm not gonna elaborate on that, but I work at Cambia Health Solutions, which is a 100-year-old healthcare company that kind of evolved into more of an app-centric and technology company, and it's with that um, culture of innovation which allowed me to build this program kind of from scratch. So here's the background. It started off a couple years ago and was formalized earlier last year. So it's been a program at our organization for about a, uh, about a year and a half. And it landed on using interactive partially because it pays homage to a previous life before Cambio, but also because it translates to a very hands-on proactive program, which I'll be expanding on later. And then if you look at the, de the definition, it's kind of interesting because it means of two people or of things, influencing or having an effect on each other. And that kind of speaks to the collaborative nature of ITD as well. So that, that kind of stuck with me and interactive is what I landed on. Truth be told, you will not find an interactive threat defense uh, at least named that program. Um, as you saw from the raise of hands, you'll find IR, CTI, and red teaming kind of everywhere, but you won't find interactive threat defense. And then, of course, threats are what we're combating, and our defense is what we're improving. So here's a snapshot of the program portfolio, and the mission is to provide a proactive, data-driven, hands-on approach to identify risks and validate security controls. Now, generally in InfoSec, what we do is um, we start by identifying risks, and then we prioritize those risks, and then third, we either accept or mitigate those risks. The cool thing about interactive threat defense is it's more proactive in nature, whereas in risk management, traditionally it's very reactive. Interactive threat defense does all of those things. It, it finds these risks, it identifies them, and then it helps to mitigate them all more proactively than risk management traditionally is. Now most of you raised your hand for having the instant response program, which is, which is awesome, as you should. Um, so I won't dive into an instant, instant respo uh, response plan and process, however, um, at this point, you should have a plan and process in place. If you don't, it really explains what you need to do, start to finish, 
when an incident, when a breach happens, you have to understand who to contact, when to contact, who to communicate with, whether it's a vendor or third party. Um, a plan and process is extremely important, but it's kind of outside of the scope, so I'm gonna leave that out. But just in general, IR is all about rapid response to escalated incidents and building protections as a result. Um, CTI is, about, is all about consuming intelligence related to your industry. And finally, red teaming is all about a, uh, adversarial uh, TTPs and kind of emulating those things to build your defense proactively. So I know what you're thinking. Uh, a unicorn is required. I will tell you with absolute certainty that I am not an InfoSec unicorn. But I do find that if you're really good at instant response, you can also be really good at red teaming. If you're really good at red teaming, you can be good at instant response. That's not always the case, but for example, a red teamer might be injecting into processes. They might be creating registry settings. They might be dropping files. They might be opening network sockets. These are all the same artifacts that instant responders look for, so it's really just a correlation of technologies, but a change in tools that you're using. So you can kind of learn either or depending on um, what, you're, what you're doing today. Next, it kind of sounds like SecOps, but I actually find this to be a very loaded term nowadays. And I've found that some organizations call uh, their SOC a SecOps team. I've also um, found that some organizations will call uh, basically the entire gambit of InfoSec programs that they have a SecOps uh, team. So I think it's kind of loaded, so ITD isn't that, right? It's the instant response, threat intelligence, and red teaming only. That's all it is. Now, a valid concern is you may not have enough resources, uh, but these capabilities really balance each other out really well, which I'll explain later on in the, in the presentation. And some of you might also be thinking, all right, great, Eric, this is just a purple team. This, is done this has been done before. But where a red team is emulating adversary TTPs and a blue team is kind of defending against that type of stuff and the red team, um, a, a purple team really bridges the gap between communication between those t uh, two teams. What ITD is trying to achieve is filling that gap all to get together, eliminating that gap, and doing that with specific workflows. So let's talk about that. So when I say workflows, these are things like an out-of-bands chat, a centralized ITD intake system that I'll be expanding on later, and then just a simple ITD dashboard to keep everybody in the loop. What you see on screen here is a wiki, which I think at this point most organizations have, uh, and it's just a custom wiki. You create this dashboard, uh, and it has a date, a summary, an outcome of what happened or the lessons learned after each of these different events happened. The source, whether it's CTI, IR, or Red Team, it has a details page and it has the status. And the details page is just a quick link to really understand what happened for that specific event and how it was uh, responded to. So it'll have things like the manager, the handler, it'll have things like um, the technical POC, uh, POCs that were involved and the more detailed summary, the workflow uh, with date and timestamps, the IOCs and so on and so forth. What's great about this is not only can your team really understand what happened for that event if you have to hand it off, but you can kind of publish this and hand it off to a, another threat intelligence uh, a person that you're trying to communicate with for a specific event. You can hand it off to management if you want. You can, um, you can, ex, uh, you can um, make a PDF and you know, hand it off to anybody, uh, anybody on the team. So really, it's, it's all about flexibility, and I'm all about tailoring your program, regardless of what the program is, but especially with ITD. So in order to understand this in response, you have to kind of have an idea of what an incident is. And I'm not going to dive too deep into definitions. Really, I would just recommend following what the compliance definition is first. All right, so if you're in healthcare, there might be a HIPAA definition. If you're in financial, it might be PCI related. If you work in Europe, it might be GDPR. Um, just really follow the regulatory or compliance definition first, and you can't go wrong. Um, if you look at some of the definitions that are online, however, it kind of centers around the CIA triad the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and the intent to harm one of those three things. So this is very process-driven. Stick to regulatory compliance definitions first. Chances are you won't be escalating and responding to incidents and breaches every day at your organization. At least I hope not. You could. It's possible. But what we've done is expand the scope to security events to be a little bit more general. So. A security event is an ongoing or imminent information security circumstance that should be investigated to determine whether it has potential to become 
a security incident. So whether the event is ongoing or imminent will determine what methodology you might want to use. And so for ongoing, um, I really like the SANS uh, methodology. It's, it's been most effective for us, uh, the, the pick curl uh, methodology. But um, I'm not going to deep dive into every single one of these phases. However, um, preparation is all about personnel, training, pre-established plan, plan and process, like I mentioned earlier. Identification is that precursor where you first hear of an incident. Could be from a CISAC, could be from another organization. It's really that precursor. Containment is all about ensuring an incident is isolated. Eradication is done to make sure an attacker is completely out of your organization. Recovery is kind of getting back to business as usual. And then finally, lessons learned is kind of wrapping everything up, bringing everybody together to figure out what happened and how to make sure that doesn't happen again. The only reason I bring this up is because I want to put a lot of emphasis on containment and lessons learned. Containment and lessons learned. The reason is, is because one of the keys to incident response is agility. You have to be rapid. And the containment phase is not a good time to start re-architecting and re-engineering re certain technologies that you do have. This is the time where you have to make sure that uh, a system is isolated, that the, pr that the hacker is out of your uh, network um, with that eradication phase next. Uh, just make sure that that problem is contained before getting ahead of yourself. And lessons learned is incredibly important, but often overlooked. <clears throat> so you do not want to let an incident go to waste. And this is also one of the core um, features of the ITD intake, which like I said, I'll get to in a few slides. Now for those imminent security events that might get brought up, you might want to apply kind of an attacker's lens to what might actually happen if something is followed through with. And when I say imminent, I mean something like um, seeing odd desktop behavior, a patch now vulnerability assessment, this could be a threat actor information uh, from threat intelligence. And on the left side, you see the cyber kill chain. On the right side, you see the MITRE attack framework. This could be threat modeling. This could be a hacker methodology. Any framework you might find interesting to apply that attacker lens so that you, you respond appropriately. So some of the keys to success for incident response are <clears throat> pay close attention to lessons learned, right? Yes, I'm going to put more emphasis on that. I can never put more emphasis on this, or enough, I should say. Do not neglect an opportunity for improvement. Um, don't let an incident go to waste. For example, a specific business unit might have been compromised, one of their systems might have been involved in an incident. Just closing the gap on that one incident, that one problem, um, is, is fine. However, it's probably a systemic problem. You might want to use that opportunity to then talk to that business unit about really understanding their posture. It might have been a missing patch that, that happened, which is, you know, you just patch it up, you make sure that the attacker is out. But then they might also have a lack of security agents. They might have configuration management problems. They might have a bunch of security waivers in place because they're afraid that security is going to break their stack. Use this as an opportunity to, I don't want to say strike fear into them, but use it as an opportunity to really explain um, what's going on and how to make sure that an incident doesn't happen again. Third is practice makes perfect, right? Practice, 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 practice. Um, if you're not practicing at least once a year with some type of exercise, um, you should be. And try and get as many uh, business units involved as you can, right? Get legal involved, get privacy involved, get PR or strategic communication involved. Let those folks know this is what you're trying to achieve during an incident or a breach. Really understand that with the entire business rather than isolating it to your security team. But I will say what's really effective as well is if you do some type of war gaming with your SOC or your SecOps, that can be really effective as well. And then constantly improve on visibility. If you can't detect an attack, you've already lost. And if you can't investigate the attack, you've lost even harder. So always expanding on visibility is incredibly important. And I'm going to just jump to that, talk to that a little bit more, and then go to threat intelligence. So this is um, my vision, uh, pun intended, for uh, visibility detection and response stack. And I think this is a really common pitfall where you might be an organization that is trying to emulate one of your uh, partner organizations, or you might be uh, an organization that's trying to get the best in breed product, um, or a vendor is really good at selling you a product. That's a bad thing to do. I think it should start down at the bottom with log management and work its way up. 
And if you do this, your implementations are going to be a lot more effective. You're going to get a, little, a lot more value out of your products and much, much more, much more, uh, much more quickly. So starting with log management, this is a good opportunity to get the entire business involved, right? It might not just be about InfoSec use cases. A lot of them might be, it might be compliance, it might be incident response. If you're starting from like a top-down approach, it might be uh, operational though. Um, you might need troubleshooting logs for other parts of the business. Um, so really understanding what the use cases are will drive the data sources that you need from log management. Then you can start ingesting those, um, those sources and have a really good idea of what you have already before um, working on your analytics platforms, which by that I mean a, a SIM solution of some sort, a SIM, a user, uh, an entity behavior analytics platform. Um, these are technologies, like I said, that stack on top of each other. And one thing that I hear about with analytics platforms is next-gen SIM, uh, cloud SIM. I hear about these terminologies all the time, and I think give one to two years from now, um, a lot of the things you see in these next-gen SIMs right now are going to be pretty standard. Um, so be patient with this. Um, you're going to see a ton of pre-built use cases which could help you with the use cases you've already established at your organization. You're going to have a bunch of data sources they can already ingest for you. They're going to be either SaaS or on-prem, which is fantastic. They're going to be able to ingest from an, a centralized data lake of some sort. These are all going to be standard. I think what next-gen, at least for me, actually means is the licensing model of these different uh, analytics platforms. We have so much data at our fingertips that we can almost realistically detect, uh, uh, detect some of these more sophisticated attacks at our organization. However, we're often handcuffed by events per second, by consumption-based modeling, by gigs per, gigs per day. I think what you're going to find is a, a change in that licensing model and a better opportunity for us to better detect our, our uh, technology. So once you get to that point, you really want to enrich and understand the data you have ingested. And if you can do that, you can have much higher fidelity alerts coming out of your SIM, and you can research and get lower MTTR, lower MTTD, and overall have a better SOC uh, security posture. Now, I will caveat that with, you could probably slide this out, especially if you have uh, an analytics platform that already has threat intelligence built in. However, I do think threat intelligence just in general is um, pretty important for adding context. Once you get to that point, like I said, high fidelity alerts, um, higher success for response, you can now automate some of these things. You can't automate all the things. I know um, that was a, a huge discussion we had just a couple years ago. We wanted to bring in a so solution to kind of fill that, um, that gap that a lot of us have of you know, being undermanned and needing to respond faster and more accurately. But the reality of it is a lot of those um, automation playbooks come directly from security tools to include this analytics platform. So start from the bottom, log management, and then kind of lead into automation. On to threat intelligence. I'm going to pause here for a second to add suspense. So it's all about the dark web when we talk about threat intel, right? Um, what I actually do with Twitter, uh, it's frustratingly accurate to a certain extent. But a quick note about the dark web. Um, do you have to speak multiple, language, uh, multiple languages um, to be the best threat intel analyst or researcher? Do you have to be able to reverse malware? Do you have to be ingrained in multiple deep web forums and, and marketplaces? To be the absolute best, yeah, probably. To be honest, you, you probably should. But to be effective in threat intelligence and use OSINT to your, to your advantage and start a threat intelligence program at your organization, I don't, I don't think that those things are necessary. But some of the common concerns that I hear about pretty often is that technical barrier to entry. It's not just about configuring and setting up Tor to connect to these marketplaces and forums. It's about knowing what onion addresses to, to navigate to that actually prove value for you and your organization. It's also about making sure you're not getting in trouble. If you've talked about this with a leg legal team, their hair is probably on fire just talking about this, interacting with people on the dark web. And I understand this is a really common concern, so you may not want to dive right into this, but it, it is important. However, if you're really curious, this is not the end all be all, you can look at these uh, kind of clear web search engines like uh, Amia and Dark Search. Dorks are supported. If you're really curious what's on the dark web, it's on the clear web. 
so you don't have to worry about any of those uh, technical or um, trouble legal problems. You can just search for something and it'll, it'll pop up with you know, whatever your company might, name might be, including whatever you put in Dork. So threat intelligence can be tough to explain, uh, even to InfoSec professionals, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but this is the best way that I found. Um, your organization is a delicate ecosystem of these intertwined um, processes, and they are well understood. Unfortunately, we have these outside influences that are out of our control, and this is where threat intelligence comes into play, and this is why it's so important. So I work in healthcare, as I, as I mentioned, and if you look at the screen here, hacktivists might not like U.S. healthcare in general. Um, a cyber criminal might find the value in the data that we own. Uh, an opportunist might come across a misconfigured system and just take advantage of that. A nation state, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, might attack us to, uh, to take our um, IP or something sim uh, similar to that. So, so for each of these categories, the better you understand the exact attackers that are targeting your, or your organization, the better you can understand those tactics, techniques, procedures, the better you can understand the IOCs, and the better you can understand the mitigations that you have to put into place. So I'm not gonna dive a lot into that. However, I do wanna talk about a few key things about threat intelligence when you're first start getting started. And the first is building that trust. You really have to build trust, and a great way to do that is if you're from the DOD or government background, you probably have some type of clearance or you have an understanding at least of the classification system. This is kind of the private sector equivalent of that. It's from US CERT and it explains what you can and cannot share whenever you're sharing information between different communities and different organizations. So I'm not gonna read every single um, word here, but <clears throat> TLP Red is all about um, participants only, Amber is all about organizational only, green is community, and then white's for, uh, fair game. But the better you implement this and the faster, the more trust you can build um, when you're uh, communicating with other organizations. And then you can start doing those things. You can start joining communities, you can start subbing the feeds. Um, <clears throat> one that I really like because it's industry specific is an ISAC, an Information Sharing and an Analysis Center. And like I said, if you're in uh, healthcare, they have HISAC. If you're in uh, finance, they have FISAC. They have one for DOD and government and IT, and they have a lot of really great ways that you can start ingesting, at the very least, and consuming uh, deduplicated threat intelligence data, which is specific to your industry. And this is extremely important. You can also start consuming feeds like uh, the US certs, some of these other um, government feeds like AIS from DHS. Um, Recorded Futures is a paid for tip uh, threat intelligence provider. However, they have a free feed that you can subscribe to which provides a lot of cool data. They have news, targeted industries um, for that day, emerging threat actors, vulnerabilities currently being exploited, emerging malware. A lot of these really cool things that you need from threat intelligence comes from a lot of these feeds. So these are great ways to get started if you don't have a threat intel program. And then Shamefully, I threw social media on here. Uh, so you can set up a tweet deck. Uh, it can be a non-attrib uh, account if you want, but set up a tweet deck. Start following these, these hackers that are posting and bragging online. Security researchers re releasing uh, different code in, in no days. Uh, a lot of the thought leaders in, in, these, um, in these areas will prove a lot of value right out of the, right out of the uh, rip. And Reddit, I was really, uh, <laughs> debating whether or not to add this because it's, um, it's kind of hit or miss. Don't spend more than a couple minutes on this, but you can have a multi-reddit that combines a lot of the infosec related um, subreddits and then just have like kind of a single pane of glass and read through that real quickly. Like I said, spend a couple minutes. If you're not finding value in it, just add plus memes at the end of it and then you'll, you'll at least have fun. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the things that I really love about threat intelligence is the impact it can have for vulnerability management. And prioritizing vulnerabilities is insanely difficult. We have these Vuln scanners, and it gives you this, uh, this score that's pretty good. Sometimes it's based off of NVD CVSS scores. Sometimes it's based off of the vendor scoring it. Um, sometimes it's based off of um, an exploitation being available in Metasploit. Uh, this is still not enough. That is not enough to prioritize these hundreds and probably thousands of volumes that we have to assess day to day in our corporate environment. 
So what threat intel does is it helps prioritize volumes based off of things like times it's been seen in the wild, right? If it's actively being discussed on dark web forums, if exploit developers on a web, uh, dark web are spending time developing POCs for these type of exploits. The other cool thing is, um, it's kind of well known at this point that the uh, Chinese NDD is quicker, quicker to publish than the US NDD. And so it's kind of nice to have that threat intelligence background. If you can't read uh, Chinese, then uh, threat intelligence providers kind of help you with that. Another thing that I use OSINT for, um, and it's kind of low barrier to entry, is uh, tying back to instant response, right? We get vendors that reach out to us and let us know that they've had a breach, minor or major, and a lot of vendors are good at doing that. So by this point, you should have some internal and external communication templates, really understanding the root cause. If they're reaching out to your users, you can understand um, what's going on with them. However, your third parties may not be good at notifying you promptly, or notifying you at all for that matter. So that's why I really like OSINT. You follow blogs, you follow news articles, you subscribe to these communities, and if they don't notify you, the verbiage of those templates changes dramatically. When you reach out to them instead of them reaching out to you, that changes the whole dynamic of instant response. You wanna know what they're hiding and why they're hiding it. Um, and that kind of changes the template as well. So use OSINT to kind of leverage learning about your vendors um, and talking about instant response. And then if you're not directly involved in that incident that you do discover in news articles and blogs and so on and so forth, you can at least use those lessons learned. So use those lessons learned. And uh, the one that kind of pops out to me is a few weeks ago, Capital One was breached. Um, we weren't directly involved uh, as a relationship with Capital One, but what happened was it was a server-side request forgery. The attacker forwarded a request through a misconfigured WAF that was on a host in AWS, and they were able to query the EC2 metadata service to pull down credentials. They used those credentials to reach out to S3, list all of the information that was in there, and then got pulled down all the information, which is kind of a disaster, but this is a good learning experience, right? Even though we weren't impacted, we jumped on a call, we assessed our environment because we use AWS. Um, if you use a WAF, you might want to discuss that. You might want to just go through a, kind of a checklist of what they learned from their incidents, and then you adapt that to your own environment. So on to red teaming. So I think the red teaming is usually the odd man out in most organizations, especially for small and medium-sized businesses but it's vitally important for assessing your posture, and it's also my personal favorite, so I'm gonna to get to nerd out for a little bit here. But <clears throat> oftentimes when we're going through the risk assessment process, we land on a technology to mitigate the risk when we, we kind of just trust fall into vendors and depend on them for fixing that mitigated problem. Um, we should be testing those vendor mitigations and technologies. We should be testing what we're um, not filling the gaps for. And that's really important um, when you're looking at a red team. Now, when you're first starting out, you do not want to cause impact when you're doing red team, right? You do not want to be that team responsible for crushing a business critical service. Um, you have to build trust first. And I pulled these ROEs down from a Microsoft red team. I added one of my own because it's applicable to my environment. But <clears throat> obtain permission to conduct red team activities first. I think this is important when you're first starting out, maybe less so as you progress and gain that trust. But follow the change management process. Let teams know what you're trying to achieve with a red team, and then you can let them decide you know, if, they're ca if you're causing some type of problem with their application stack, they need to know who to contact, what your back out process kind of uh, is. Once you start gaining that trust, then you can kind of do these things on your own. But you see a lot of these other ones you do not want to intentionally cause any type of harm. Like I said, crushing these services. You don't want to cause any problems in your environment. And treat the critical and high findings from your red right team just like you would in vulnerability management. Don't share this out or overshare it. Also, when you're first starting out, you likely won't have the time or resources to have a full-fledged red team campaign where full-fledged red team uh, campaign might be emulating uh, uh, APT of some sort, so they might footprint uh, LinkedIn, pull down some email addresses, either brute force or social engineer with spear phishing. They might gain access to a system, clean up, escalate privileges, implant, move laterally, try and gain access to a DC. They might try and look for, uh, for information that is uh, sensitive in your environment. 
when you're first starting out, um, there's not really a time or a place for that. Instead, if you break it down by each of those steps or some type of hacker methodology, you can address those things one by one, um, unless, of course, there's a caveat where one uh, phase might be dependent on the previous one. But if you follow these steps and kind of break them down one by one and then do those TTPs, you can get a lot of value when you're first uh, starting out with a red team. And conveniently, these also align pretty well with the MITRE, MITRE ATT&CK framework as well. So it would not be an InfoSec conference without some mention of the MITRE ATT&CK framework, right? This is that mention. I'm not gonna do like the 20,000 foot overview and kind of dive into it. I will, excuse me, I wanna get uh, straight to the point and give you a potential uh, delivery point. If you're not familiar with uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework, I'll give you a quick summary. Um, the 30 second view is, let's say, an attacker gains access to a system, whether it's spear phishing, whether it's an unpatched system. An attacker has a finite number of things, granted it's much more than the MITRE ATT&CK framework has, but they have a finite number of things they can do when they access that system, right? So the MITRE ATT&CK framework explains what an attacker could do, and that kind of walks the full gambit um, in a 12-step process that you can follow and actually um, start to run through. So. I have five steps listed here. I, I started with easy steps because they're actually really easy to, to start down this path. However, they are kind of tedious. I am gonna dive into these five steps, but this is me um, letting you know that it's, it's actually pretty easy to start implementing right out of the bat. So I'm not a huge fan of spreadsheets. Um, I ditch them every ch chance I get, but um, Cyber War Dog, if you haven't heard of him, he's one of the best threat hunters out there. I've applied his kind of metric spreadsheet to red teaming, which I'll explain in a few slides. But if you use a tracking spreadsheet like this, you let managers know the progress that you're making and you understand your maturity over time. And then you execute these red canary unit tests. I, I have a GitHub link there so you can kind of use that. And then you validate what is being detected or not detected in your security stack. After that, you score that outcome in the spreadsheet and then mature over time. So this is just a quick look at the, what that metric spreadsheet looks like. Like I said, I hate spreadsheets, and I'll talk about how you progress past this, but this is a good starting point. This is the first three phases of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. I kind of blew it up. Like I said, there's 12 phases, but this is initial access, execution, persi persistence. The reason I um, threw this on screen is because you see a column right next to it. That's what's gonna become the scoring column, and you're gonna develop this into a heat map. So once you have that spreadsheet ready, you can start scoring. This is something that I have that's vastly different from Cyber War Dogs, where I converted this into more of a red team mindset. And so really what it is, is a score of one is it was logged or it was not logged or detected in any way. Number two, is it, was, it was logged but no alert was thrown. Number three is, is an alert was thrown but is not being triaged by any team like a SOC or a SecOps team. Four is an alert was thrown and it was sent to a ticketing system like JIRA, Remedy, uh, ServiceNow for a team to triage and work on. And then five is the te technique was fully blocked or mitigated. Um, this could be with something like a, a SOAR and some automation. So one through five, and then once you have this scorecard, you have your scoring spreadsheet, you can start executing on these red canary, what they call execution framework. So this is really testing easy mode. It's honestly really this easy. You download the Atomic Red Team Execution Framework. You install the script, which is just a PS1 file in the root. You install that script. You import the module. And then you're ready. You can execute all of these with just a, a quick you know, couple of arguments. But if you execute these, I'll, I'll warn you that they'll all execute at one time. And it's really hard to assess your different security tools all at one time when you're executing all of 120 or so of these checks. So instead, I recommend just tacking on the um, all-show-details-information-action-continue. And what it's going to do, it's going to print to the console all of these different techniques that you, then you can just copy-pasta into a PowerShell command prompt or a command shell. And what it's going to look like is what I have down on the bottom screen there. It's an uh, invoke expression, right, the IEX. It's downloading a string from a GitHub user content for Mimikatz, and then it is um, invoking Mimikatz to dump the creds. So this is a pretty common technique, and <clears throat> what you might want to do after you execute this one line is look in your EDR. Was that detected? Um, was it detected in proxy, calling back to that, um, that content? 
Was it detected at IDS, IPS, calling back? I mean, there's so many different ways to detect this that you should be looking through your uh, technology stack and then, of, of course, like I said, progressing and maturing over time. Um, your mileage may vary, to be honest. You don't get 100% coverage, like I said, but I honestly haven't found a product, not even a commercial product, that has complete coverage over the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So <clears throat> last time I checked, there were 259 total MITRE ATT&CK techniques. This covers down on about half of those, um, 117, which is a great start. It'll keep you busy for a while. So once you do that, you look in your security tools to make sure it's detected or was not, and then you develop this heat map. Then you average up all these scores, and then you figure out the outcome, right? The average over time for each of the different um, areas. And now you can average the scores and see how you're improving, and this is great for management, so it's good for creating value. Like I said, this is how you improve scores. You can work with vendors. Um, you can explain to them how they can improve their product. They are usually very receptive. They might even have a roadmap to um, implement a, a protection that you're talking about with them. EDR is great. NDR is great. I promised open source. So Sysmon and AuditD for both Windows and, and Unix are both fantastic. And just by implementing these in your environment, you can detect at least a third to a quarter of those techniques. And then you can progress to fully protecting. Um, you probably heard of the Swift on security Sysmon. Um, I personally like Olaf Hartong's a little better because it aligns directly with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Same idea with Unix. Um, you don't see this one very often in talks, but BFuzzy has a really good one also that aligns with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So from a red team infrastructure perspective, once you have MITRE ATT&CK framework down, you're proving value to the red team, now you're ready to build out a red, uh, an infrastructure. Now, <clears throat> I understand they put public for some of the VPCs. What I meant uh, to mean was you just whitelist your corporate network and then you're ready to start testing safely. Um, this doesn't have to be AWS, this can be DigitalOcean, it could be uh, Azure, it could be GCP, wherever you want to build this. Start with an open VPN. At this point, you can assess your internal, internal network with Kali, but then whenever you connect out to the open VPN service, you can then text, uh, test out your external footprint. And then you have the opportunity to build out your infrastructure. Uh, redirectors, your command and control, your team servers, Cobalt Strike, Empire, those sorts of things. And I recommend looking into the automated versions of those. There's RA, uh, RAI, uh, Rapid Attack Infrastructure, that's kind of um, infrastructure agnostic. But there's also um, the Terraform version that came from Rasmouse that's also um, pretty good as well. Now once you have the infrastructure in place, you can start going down that hacker methodology one by one. I like footprinting a lot because this is extremely low barrier to entry, really easy. And it's great, especially if you are implementing user and entity behavior analytics, because you can dump the output of these tools directly into a watch list and just keep an eye on what those users, users are doing, because they are very likely to be targeted, right? Then you can jump ahead to enumeration. If you haven't run these three tools or something similar, I highly recommend it. Um, Nmap can help to reduce the external system footprint and also the port footprint. This can be extremely effective. But it also has a side benefit of making sure that your WAF or your authentication services are protected um, efficiently. You shouldn't be able to connect directly to an IP address, um, kind of bypassing those auth services and the WAF. So this is a good way to make sure that your firewalls are properly fencing those things off. Eyewitness is really good about inventory and taking snapshots of your web ass assets. And then Amass is this tool that from, they're from OWASP and they're really good about explaining certificates, DNS, and um, subdomains and those sorts of things. So this is really good to, to start down the path of. Exploitation initial access, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but there's some areas in here that once you get to a good point with the previous phases, you can kind of jump to this with spear phishing, repeating um, what pen testers might be doing, kind of uh, ad hoc independent testing depending on what the business need is. And then finally, how to mature. So you want to get to a point where you're automating a lot of these things that you're doing. Breach attack simulation, uh, Caldera and Navigator are a good um, way to get out of the spreadsheet mindset and automate a lot of those things that you're doing with those unit tests from, um, from Red Canary. You can also go to Active Directory auditing and do some of these techniques that are very, very well documented and branch out from there. And then living off the LAN TTPs I see is 
a similar set of really cool techniques that are almost like MITRE ATT&CK, but kind of take it a step further with slightly less tracking uh, mechanisms, but are really cool techniques that you can um, use to uh, test your infrastructure. So tying it all together, how do we combine these efforts and kind of just change the hat that we're putting on day to day when we're doing these things? Well, one example is on Twitter, um, going back to the meme, a researcher devel develops an, um, a zero day and they talk about it without disclosing it to a vendor. Going into incident response mode, you don't have to just kind of throw it to the vulnerability management team. You can escalate this if you have relationships with the business units. Let them know when the vendor does release a patch, quickly patch it, you're good to go. And then a red team can help with kind of the, the POC development, making sure that you're truly not susceptible to this exploit. And they can also help to um, set up a VM or a Docker container to do, do some light testing to let stakeholders know what the um, impact could actually be. Example two is um, red teaming gaining initial access. You should go into IR mode. An attacker might be able to gain initial access just like you did as a red teamer. So again, go into IR mode, make sure nobody else uh, access these, the system that you gain access to. And then as a threat hunter um, and threat intel, just kind of pivot and, and go from there. And then finally, the um, full process start to finish. The ITD intake, which I've mentioned many times before, it could be anything from a risk register, it could be GRC, it could be ITSM, like the JIRAs and the ServiceNows. But what you're trying to do is consolidate all of these programs into one consolidate, consolidated intake system so you can start to prioritize those effectively. And these are things from IR lessons learned, threat intel data, and red team findings. This kind of looks like an OODA loop. Really, it's just an iterative process to make sure you're constantly improving on your security posture. Not gonna dive into metrics, but uh, threat intel feeds are incredibly important. Um, I mentioned that, but that might kind of fall off eventually, so having feeds that are duplicated kind of becomes a waste of time, so that might be a metric that falls off, so use these metrics to prove the value over time and kind of adjust them as you, as you see fit for your business. And then the last few slides here, some interesting side benefits of ITD. We had a job posting earlier this year, and we had a huge influx of resumes. So if you're a manager and you're looking to get some interesting candidates, really well uh, qualified candidates, this might be a good option to get them interested because um, I was really surprised to see some really good resumes and some really good candidates out of this um, job posting. It also helps to reduce um, burnout. You might have um, some of these really smart InfoSec people that just don't really like the exact thing they're doing. So if they don't like in, in, uh, incident response, they might wanna shift to threat intelligence or red team for a little bit. And then they can get the hang of incident response and the pressure is associated with that. So it helps to reduce burnout. There's also the sense of urgency, which I've talked about, and also being more proactive rather than reactive. And then the summary slides, it all comes down to people, processes, and technology. I really think you should nail down the basics in InfoSec. That's patching, IDS, IPS, I AV. Make sure, make sure you're good there, and then think about a program like this to help assess those gaps a little bit more in depth. Um, ironically enough, when I was putting this uh, presentation together, I started writing this down, and I was like, this is probably um, the same set of uh, things you would want from an InfoSec professional across the board, so I, I threw them down anyway, but offensive or defensive background or tribal knowledge are both uh, extremely helpful in this specific program. Processes are all about maturing over time, establishing requirements, letting your business know what you're trying to achieve, and then technology, right? I talked about that pyramid or that full stack. You might not be the creator or the product owner of these specific technologies, but you should have high input into what's going on with these specific technologies, SIM, EDR, TIP, SOAR, all these ones we've been talking about, at the very least a content creator for some of these things. And with that, I'm gonna field some questions and I really appreciate your time, thank you guys so much.